Today's video is going to be about a topic that we can say with some certainty is as old as human civilization itself. Cats and dogs in their domesticated form have lived with us at the very least since we developed agriculture and arguably for tens of thousands of years before that too. As hard as it is, and let's be honest, as weird as it is, all cats and dogs that we live with today are domesticated versions of formerly wild species, some of whom still exist in the wild. But the domestication of cats and dogs was a process that took thousands of years in the making. And though we consider them today to be mainly pets that we keep for companionship, for the vast majority of their existence in human society, Cats and dogs have been working animals and as such were considered an inseparable and unshakable part of our society. Cats and dogs were responsible above all else for guarding our food from other animals and for tasks that humans are ill-fitted to do themselves. Now this is a hugely mutually beneficial relationship for both humans and cats and dogs. This allowed humans to become better at things they were already good at and allowed them to delegate tasks that they were by nature ill-fitted to do to cats and dogs. And that we are all here still feeding and guarding each other can be seen as evidence of, or at the very least a suggestion of, that these are inherent traits that we are all born with. But none of us, cats and dogs included, would be here today if our ancestors hadn't formed bonds with these animals. And through the millennia and centuries, this bond has only grown stronger and stronger with time. Yet, cats and dogs, though integral and inseparable from our society as they are, couldn't be more different from each other as animals. And after all, there's a reason that there exists the saying, fighting like cats and dogs. So let's dig into that together and examine why humans have had cats and dogs for thousands of years. And the purpose of this video is to examine how and why we did that, how we co-evolved together, why cats and dogs are so different from one another, and how and why we have bred specific cats and dogs to, for our own purposes and tried to get to the truth about cats and dogs. Now, the most logical question to ask yourself right now is how can cats and dogs be descended from lions and tigers and panthers and wolves when a child can run down any cat or dog and pick them up like they were day old bred? Now, this was in most cases done through a process called artificial selection. Now, artificial selection is different from the natural selection you may be familiar with, which has become synonymous with Charles Darwin. Now, artificial selection, on the other hand, means that rather than the biggest and strongest and smartest and fastest animals surviving, cats and dogs that were nice to us, or at the very least small enough not to threaten us, were the ones who ultimately survived. Now, this is by no means unique to cat and dogs, by the way. This can be seen all over the world with things like trees. Now, apples, just to take a very obvious example, offer no evolutionary advantages for surviving winter. But humans like apples, and so trees that produce apples tended to be the ones that humans didn't chop down for firewood in dangerously cold winters. Trees that otherwise were bigger and stronger and sturdier and could have survived for more than a hundred years of their own tended to be the ones that humans chopped up as logs for the fire or furniture for their homes or ships to sail on or weapons to hunt or kill their enemies with. But the apple tree survived year after year after year 
because it didn't matter how cold it got or how many spears we needed or how many ships we needed. As a general rule of nature, trees that get chopped up and or burned tend not to produce apples. And so humans chop down every other tree in their areas except the apple trees, because if you chop down apple trees, you have no apples to eat. And so, these apple trees survived through the process of artificial selection, even though they may have been the least likely to survive without any contact with humans. And this same principle applied to the domestication of animals. On their own, in nature, cats that are bigger and stronger and can attack a person and scratch out their face and arms and run away at the sign of danger, may be much, less, much more likely to survive on their own, whereas cats that didn't attack humans and like to be petted could end up being fed milk and, and cream and, and fish and meat and whatnot over the entire winter, whereas the stronger and faster and smarter cats would have struggled over the winter trying to provide for themselves. In the same way, not that much has changed. In the modern day, just like it was in ancient times, cats that at full age and maturity could only reach an adult human at about knee height tended to just be left alone and allowed to wander the village or the city. Whereas any human habitation where cats the size of lions and tigers and panthers would venture into human habitation they would almost immediately and almost universally find themselves surrounded by humans holding fire and sharp pointy objects trying to kill them on a regular basis. Cats, or Felis Catus, Felis Domesticus, to try and use the proper titles, though they have been around for what constitute as basically forever, have been domesticated for a very conservatively estimated seven and a half thousand years and nowhere was that more prominently nor as consistently as in the Near East and most famously of all in ancient Egypt where cats were an inseparable part of the culture for more than 3,000 years and even several Egyptian deities took on cat-like form. Now from what relatively little, though when you think about it, mountain of archaeological evidence that we have from periods dating that far back, it seems that amongst the most important aspects of cats back then was the same as it is today. Their companionship to, to humans and their natural state as ace predators that posed no physical threat to most adult humans. We can piece together enough anecdotal archaeological evidence that cats rose to prominence by killing venomous snakes, scorpions, and spiders around the pharaohs and their family. This led to the pharaohs of Egypt cultivating domesticated cats for thousands and thousands of years, and long before any other society started doing so. Now, this also makes a lot of biological sense for both cats and humans. As we know, not dying of venomous attacks has huge evolutionary advantages over those who do die of venomous attacks. And feeding the animal that uh, kills things that threaten you and your offspring makes a lot of sense for humans. So does killing things that threaten the human that feeds you make a lot of sense for cats. Now, when we talk about cats in the ancient world, we have to remember two things. First being, we only have reliable evidence going back around 5,000 years, but we shouldn't see that as a lack of evidence, or that only the pharaohs had a story worth telling, but rather that 3,000 plus years is just a really, really, really long time to keep something intact, undamaged, or not repurposed. Secondly, we have to remember when we talk about cats in ancient Egypt is that the Nile River in Egypt was the largest food production site in the world for a near unbroken spell of around 5,000 years. In a society that didn't have massive storage houses made out of concrete and metal, let alone something like refrigerators and freezers, surrounding yourself with carnivorous animals that 
pose no threat to you threat to you physically don't eat grains or vegetables but do eat all of the things that want to eat the things in your only and all important food storage is just an incredibly successful strategy in both the short and long term realms and small wonder that people started doing this independently of each other and for century after century after century because it seems that all over the planet at different times and different speeds people inevitably stumbled upon the same winning formula of domesticating cats the fantastical herodotus tells us that in ancient egypt it was not only forbidden to kill a cat but that when the family cat died the family would shave off their eyebrows as a sign of mourning and not only that herodotus also tells us that the egyptians had a sacred city where they took and disposed of their dead cat in a seemingly elaborate ceremony which he describes in great and near excruciating detail considering how many other things he leaves out and for the same reason that people kept cats on the nile cats were hugely popular on ships for the around the same amount of times that we have had cats and ships by and large then and now cats dislike water they're not great swimmers and so once you set sail cats are very unlikely to jump off the ship and try to swim for land but more than that when you have a limited supply of food and water and due to the very nature and definition of what oceans are no chance of resupplying having something below deck that can see in the dark and move faster than any human on the ship can is a really really good way and a really consistent and solid way to keep rodents away from consuming and or dying in your only source of food and water on the psychological level having a living creature on board that everyone can talk to but doesn't talk back increases exponentially in value with each passing day at sea with a finite space to move on and the same people that you have to put up with day in and day out with sometimes days weeks or months until you have a chance to see another human being But dogs are very different. And why are they so different? It is because unlike cats, we have closely co-evolved with dogs and very directly so. Dogs, like people, are inherently fond of fire. Dogs will gather near a fire because they know it keeps other animals away. And humans also cook food on fire and humans share food that they have. Therefore, learning to like fire was incredibly beneficial for both species of humans and dogs. Similarly, the facts are groups of people that like wolves and groups of wolves that like people are much more likely to survive in any situation that they face. And since both wolves and humans are pack animals, it also makes a lot of sense to then either excommunicate members of your own society or outright abandon your own group in favor of some of one more likely to survive and you can see traces of this inherently born cooperation between humans and dogs in both humans and dogs wherever you find humans and dogs if you take a cat or a bird or a horse or just about any animal in the world and point at some things those animals will look at your finger as if you have something to show them on your fingertip or you just want to draw attention to your hand in general whereas dogs are the only non-humans and again this includes primates that uh, will look at where you are pointing and not what you are pointing with and dogs will also not only look where you are pointing dogs will maintain eye contact and when you break eye contact will look to see what caused the human to break off eye contact we see this with for example when humans went hunting 
Now, human society may have had 10 hunters go out every day, of which six were really good, and four just weren't. They would slow down the group or they would scare off the prey. Now let's say that that same human society then adopts two or three friendly wolves or at the very least non-threatening to human wolves. So those six really talented hunters can go out and organize with two or three wolves in a concentrated effort. That allowed them to hunt much more prey, providing both humans and wolves with much more food than any group of 10 humans or 10 wolves could ever have come up with on their own. This was really, really useful because that meant that wherever we shot our arrows and threw our spears and stones in a certain direction, we could communicate with the dog, go over there and find out if we actually hit anything and then bring it back or if you can't bring it back, let us know and we'll come collect it. Or in terms of attack that animal, but don't attack that animal, you know, like go after the pig, but leave the horses alone because we ride those when we go hunting pigs. But also in terms of defending your home from predators, including your fellow human beings, by taking them by surprise. So smaller groups of people, when they teamed up with wolves, could take on groups much bigger and defeat them using cooperation between wolf and man. But we also shouldn't ignore a key aspect of this. Humans and dogs have evolved to be entertaining and playful. Uh, playing is an incredibly useful bonding experience exhibited by both children and puppies. And playing is also a source of routine daily exercise, healthy for both wolf and man, and has done so for more than 10,000 years. For thousands of years, wolves and later dogs have kept us company when we venture into the unknown. They have protected us from animal attack, they have guarded our herds of animals, and they have guarded our homes. But also, as studies have shown, when humans and dogs spend a lot of time together in physical proximity to one another, both humans and dogs produce the hormone oxytocin, which is sometimes called the love hormone. You may have heard of this before, as it is also the hormone that uh, mothers produce when they breastfeed their children. This would also go a long way to explain the unspoken bond that humans and dogs have always had. Dogs have been around human societies for anywhere between 40,000 and 10,000 years, depending on which source you believe and how strictly you want to define the difference between Canis lupus, Canis lupus familiaris, and Canis familiaris. It's just a fancy way of saying wolves, domesticated wolf dogs, and domesticated dogs. Now, I mentioned earlier that cats were mainly in the Near East. And though there have been virtually no great human settlements without dogs, there are clearly some civilizations that were objectively more dog people and some that were objectively more cat people. And this is where the most basic and fundamental part of all history comes into play. Geography. Where cats tended to be found that was around settled populations that needed constant pest control in order to sustain their way of life. But dogs, however, tended to be found where wolves tended to be found. Now, what ancient civilizations do we know that were largely dominated by mountainous areas interspersed with forests and wilderness? Now, the most obvious examples of societies fitting those descriptions being the founders of Western civilization, the Greeks and the Romans. And who do we know to be predominantly dog people? Well, wouldn't you just look at that? the Greeks and the Romans. Now, rather than spend all of their time at home farming near a massive river that provides all of their food and killing rats and other rodents, the Greeks and the Romans on a near unshakable yearly basis went somewhere far away from their homes and stabbed their neighbors with pointy objects. The earliest time we have of this exact phenomenon in Western civilization is in the writing of the historian, military genius, and dog person numero uno, Xenophon of Athens. 
Now, Xenophon wrote an extensive uh, composition on hunting, sometimes translated just as on hunting or hunting with dogs. Now, Xenophon, amongst other things, tells us that dogs were a gift from the gods Apollo and Artemis, whom they originally gave to the cantor Chiron, who taught hunting and the keeping of dogs, among other things, to the Homeric heroes Odysseus and Achilles, and to the mythical founder of Rome, Aeneas, when each of them received the favor of the gods. Xenophon also tells us how to treat puppies, and not only that, he tells us that we should give our puppies short and precise names so that they learn when they are talked to, and that they should come when their name is spoken. Not only that, Xenophon also gives us an exhaustive list of names that he has gathered or suggests and gives us, along with his guide on hunting, an exhaustive list of puppy names. If you ever want to uh, name your puppy after a two and a half thousand year old ancient Greek hunting manual, now you can. In fact, dogs feature quite heavily in one of the oldest pieces of literature in Western history. Sing, O goddess, of the disastrous anger of Achilles, son of Peleus, that brought countless evils upon the Achaeans. Many a brave soul did it send hurrying down to Hades, and many a hero did it make a prize to dogs and vultures. For the will of Zeus was fulfilled from the day on which the son of Atreus, king of men, and great Achilles first fell out with one another. Dogs are such an integral part of the ancient Homeric era Greeks, we can call them that, that the most famous poem in antiquity starts with a reference to them. It's important to remember that the Iliad is a much older story, and it's only Homer's Iliad, because his version was the one that was written down. But the critical piece of information to take from this is that a nearly 3,000 year old story begins with a reference to dogs. So we can, with some amount of certainty, place dogs, at least dating back 3,000 years, to Homer's Iliad. I will talk about Homer more in upcoming videos, but I want to touch on this side of it only, uh, I want to touch on this side only uh, real quick, and again, it's been nearly 3,000 years, so I think I can spoil the plot a bit now. Many people believe, my, and I suppose I would include myself in that, as I'm listing this to you, that one of the main reasons that the Iliad survived for as long as it did, and stayed as relevant as it did, is that not only did it touch on aspects familiar to everyone living in that time, but because it talks about a very serious and taboo subject in a way that wasn't anywhere else. Forgiveness and war. Upon discovering the death of his lover and companion Patroclus at the hand of Prince Hector of Troy, Achilles flies into a rage, unsurprisingly since the poem begins with the rage of Achilles. And even if you know nothing else about the Iliad, you know that when Achilles, the greatest warrior in the known world, and the ideal manly man for 3,000 years, makes a threat, you know damn well that he is going to keep his word. Chief in all their mourning was the son of Peleus. He laid his blood-stained hand on the breast of his friend. Farewell, Patroclus, he cried, even in the house of Hades. I will now do all that I earlier promised you. I will drag Hector here before you and let dogs devour him raw. Twelve noble sons of Trojans will I also slay before your pyre to avenge you. The message couldn't be clearer. The others will be allowed the warrior's death and funeral, but Hector, who had killed someone close to Achilles, will be murdered and fed to the dogs for pure vengeance, thus, at least that's what he believed, satisfying Achilles' bloodlust and denying Hector entrance into the afterlife. 
Now, fast forward, and unsurprisingly enough, Achilles, the greatest warrior in the world, kills all of the not greatest warriors in the world, and, fi and doing so finally allows him to bury his fallen friend Patroclus, having piously avenged his life and honor. Those who were around the dead heaped up wood and built a pyre a hundred feet this way and a hundred feet that. Then they laid the dead all sorrowfully up on the top of it. They flayed and dressed many fat sheep and oxen before the pyre, and Achilles took fat from all of them and wrapped the body therein from head to foot, heaping the flayed carcasses all around it. Four proud horses did he then cast upon the pyre, groaning the while he did so. The dead hero had had house dogs. Two of them did Achilles slay and threw upon the pyre. He also put twelve brave sons of noble Trojans to the sword and laid them with the rest, for he was full of bitterness and fury. Then he committed all to the relentless and devouring might of the fire. To cut a long story short, no matter how he tries, Achilles cannot desecrate Hector's body. But returning to the point, the old king demands the return of his son from Achilles, who is stunned to meet someone who isn't afraid of him. When Achilles tries to justify what he had done, Priam simply returns his reasoning by pointing out all of the sons and fathers and brothers and friends and husbands and lovers that lay dead at the hands of mighty Achilles, and how many people would love to see Achilles' corpse desecrated in the same manner he did and still wants to do to Hector. And yet, Priamus can only imagine that Achilles' father, whom he knew, would want to bury his body. The Iliad then ends with Achilles giving Hector to King Priamus and forgiving the man who had killed the one he loved, and only then does Achilles find peace. Now Achilles famously dies shortly after in another poem, but he does find peace before death, and he does show and he and he shows that he can have compassion for the people that he killed in war. And that's very important because it shows a world where you treat your enemy with respect and see them as individuals rather than something to be torn apart and fed to the dog. The reason that I bring this up is because anyone who was anyone in the old Mediterranean world would read Homer. Or at least that's what the people who wiped out the non-Homeric reading peoples want us to believe in the history they left of themselves. But anyway, people cited Homer in the same way the people cite holy books today. The Romans saw the Iliad and to a lesser degree the Odyssey as their version of the Bible. There were answers to just about all of life's problems in there and they quoted it to each other at dinner parties. They quoted Homer when they sacked cities, and they quoted Homer when they murdered each other in cold blood for political reasons. In later times, people would even re replace the Greek pantheon with the Roman gods. And so Zeus became Jupiter, Poseidon became Neptunus, Artemis became Diana, and so on and so forth. But I mentioned amidst all of this fighting and forgiving in the Iliad, a practice that was abhorrent to the Romans. When Achilles' lover Patroclus dies, Achilles sacrifices two of his dogs in his religious burial. Romans never sacrificed dogs and it was one of the reasons that they saw themselves and their religion as being different to others. With one major exception, which I will cover in detail as the topic of my next video. Now, if the Homeric epics are the literary evidence, then in the archaeological sense, and probably my favorite one, in the volcanic ruins of the former Roman colony of Pompeii, which as you will know from my video on the history of pizza, was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius in the year 79 CE. But in the ruins of this, uh, this uh, desecrated colony of Pompeii, you can still find a warning that will seem as familiar to us today 
as did to the Romans nearly 2,000 years ago. Cave canum, beware of the dog, which features a chained up black dog and warns everyone coming close and not familiar with the dog that in fact there is a dog there and if you come in unannounced it will attack you. And this is just one aspect of life, much like the industrial baking of bread, that has not changed in the 20 or so centuries since the destruction of Pompeii. And similarly, just like it was 2000 years ago, the Romans had guard dogs. Now these guard dogs would, either, would both guard their homes and protect their families when they went off to war. But they would also take these dogs with them whenever they went to war. And if you know anything about Roman history, it was basically all of the time. Now the dogs would mainly be responsible for guarding the Roman caps and the animals that the Romans either brought with them or took from the enemy. Now Roman camps are a really fascinating topic in and of themselves and I don't really have time to get into them in detail right now. But they were a staple of the Roman military wherever they went and they wouldn't spend the day without either building or fortifying a camp. The word castrum with uh, the word for camp is where we get the name castle. Also where we get names like Chester, as in the cities of Manchester or Winchester, or the Caster, as in the famous Lancasters, which House Lannister was built on in Game of Thrones. But that is a topic for another day. The most famous of these Roman camps are the camp of Lutetia on the Seine River, which is the modern day city of Paris and capital of France. And the camp of Londinium, which is modern day London, the capital of England and the Great Britain. Now, this uh, etymological tangent aside, the most famous of these Roman guard dogs are the ones that they left behind when they abandoned the province of Germania and the fortified settlements near modern day Rottweil in modern day Germany. This Roman bred dog was famous for its strength bravery and loyalty and is still known today after the area where they were left behind and even if you haven't seen one in person you may recognize one from popular culture as Rottweiler dogs. Now this tradition that the Romans and, and most certainly Greeks did as well uh, lasted for thousands and thousands and thousands of years because Let's say you are a general or a monarch or highly influential aristocrat. By the very nature and definition of your role in society, someone, most often most likely your own subject, but from time to time your political rivals, will want you dead and therefore try to kill you. Now, due to the nature of being a monarch or highly influential aristocrat, you most likely existed in a pre-industrial society. Now, that meant that your ways of guarding your home and your bed at night were very limited. You can't install security cameras, motion sensors and fingerprint scanners in your castle or stronghold if those things won't be invented for another 1,500 years after you die. But instead of installing security cameras, motion sensors and fingerprint scanners in your castle or stronghold, you could always get a dog. Dogs have a sense of smell far superior to anything that humans possess. They hear better, they see better in the dark, they feel vibrations, and a panicking barking dog is an unmistakable sound to anyone within hearing distance to come running with their sharp pointy things and kill whoever isn't supposed to be there. Dogs spent all of their time around their masters and their inner circles, which meant that even if someone managed to steal a uniform, get undetected past the guard, who may have been drunk or asleep or bribed or even killed off, and gain access to areas where they were not supposed to be able to get into. Now, Whereas humans won't notice anything suspicious about a person in uniform walking in, in anywhere, a dog will immediately notice and be suspicious of someone entering a room 
food scent they've never smelled and hasn't been approved of by the hand that feeds. And just like that, when in the middle of a feast or a town meeting or whatever that a monarch or an influential aristocrat may get up to, if all of a sudden the king or general's dogs stands up and starts growling menacingly at whichever uniformed soldier just entered the feast hall or tent, the entire room, without exception, stands up and points their spears and swords at whoever just walked in until it can be determined why the dogs won't stop barking. Now, the most extreme form of this, and one we can still find today, is in lapdogs. This is the reason that lap dogs exist on different continents and in so many different cultures and yet all look so completely different and behave differently from one another. And the reason for that is because lap dogs are nature's ultimate panic button. You have three small dogs sleeping on your bed who are too small to attack anything bigger than a fly, which is a really, really good thing to have if for example, you are the guard outside the king's bedroom, but for obvious reasons, don't spend all of your time inside the king's bedroom. Or alternatively, you are the king who are about to be assassinated, and so dogs that are scared of anything are really useful to have around. Because anyone trying to kill the king in his sleep will have to do so without first alerting animals who have been bred for the sole purpose of being alert to any danger, and raising the alarm at the first sight of any new smell, sight or sound. This is the reason that even to this very day, whenever you see a small dog, they tend to bark like crazy at just about everything that moves. And it's because that's what people purposefully bred them to do for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The first thing to remember when we talk about things that span thousands of years is this, that these things can always differ and often depend on who you read and your own inherent biases. People who love dogs say that dogs have been around for 40,000 years and people who don't like dogs say that dogs have been around for 10,000 years. Similarly, people who love cats say that they have been around for at least 25,000 years, and people who don't like cats say they've been around for 8 to 10,000 years. But even people who like neither cat or dog agree that cats and dogs have been around human society for around 10,000 years, aligning from the time when humans changed from a hunter-gatherer society to, an ag to a sedentary agricultural society. Too often, and you will and uh, as I learned this at school, I'm going to presume you did as well, that people get lost in the nuance of these numbers. I normally don't hear the word nuance used about thousands and thousands of years, but I'm going to do it anyway in this context. Because numbers are great for putting on a multiple choice quiz if you want children to hate learning and to varying degrees themselves, then sure, multiple choice quizzes with numbers are good. But they're not very helpful if you want people to actually learn something. The main point about cats and dogs is not how many thousands of years they have been around, but the fact that they have been for thousands and thousands of years. Because all over the planet, as a general rule of thumb, for thousands of years, and longer than any modern current society has existed, wherever people are found, so are cats and dogs. Humans evolved cats and dogs because it made a lot of sense and evolutionary advantages to have animals around that don't threaten us but will help us survive in any situation. Cats have evolved differently because their needs in society were mainly for pest control. That's why most cats today are still purely bred fine-tuned killing machines because it is in their best interest to maintain peak abilities at hunting mice, rats and birds. And dogs have evolved to display the same kind of emotion and hormonal and biological reaction that mothers and children have 
And this explains why so many people in so many places of the world for such a long time have bonded so closely to dogs and why we have signs of dogs sleeping at the graves of their owners once they die because they had bonded for such a long time that uh, the dog will seek that level of bonding and comfort with the human even after the human dies. Thank you so much for watching. This was an unplanned bonus video that came about when I was researching my next video uh, about the history of Lupercalli, the origin of Valentine's Day. If you liked the video, please leave a like and a comment and consider subscribing. A lot of work goes into these videos and I have a lot more videos coming up soon. So make sure that you are subscribed and have clicked the bell button to be notified of my next video. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you soon. Thanks for watching.